I know this doesn't begin to tell it all. Uh, he is a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery, which just blows my mind, at the University of Arizona, and director of its human energy systems laboratory. He received his doctorate from Harvard and has served as professor of psychology and psychiatry at Yale University, director of the Yale Psychophysiology Center, and co-director of the Yale Behavioral Medicine Clinic. He's also written over 400 papers and several, I don't know how many books. No, nobody said how many books, but I know that this is not the first one. And this is the best one. <laughs> Chicago and Tucson, and I suspect that bridges are going to be built, um, thanks to uh, Diane and Neil and multiple people who seem to share some, some common interests about some very important questions. Um, I'm going to be talking about the afterlife experiments, and um, this is research on the topic of the possibility of survival of consciousness after death. And in the scientific world, this is very controversial. Now, I talk to many different kinds of audiences that have different beliefs in this topic. Um, and people sit, tend to fall into one of three groups. Uh, one group of people who are convinced that it's false. It's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, case closed. And by the way, that's how I was raised. And I accepted it that way. From Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and survival of consciousness after death same category. Then there are people who are agnostics. They're not sure one way or another about the topic, but they're interested in hearing more. And then, ooh, is there a way to turn the volume down a little? It's locked up. Okay. <laughs> See, I like to walk, but it makes all this noise. Um, and then there's, is there a safe place? <laughs> I'll sit down. What? Do you want to sit on the stage? <laughs> sit on the stage. Um, does this work better? Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. Maybe I'll go behind the curtain. <laughs> 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 Put it in your pocket. What? Put it in your pocket. Right in your pocket. And then walk around the outside. Okay. It'll sit on top of this pocket. You know. That'll be just like this. Oh, then I can move my hands. <laughs> a one, and a two. That's good, that's good. And then, of course, there are people who believe. Who, uh, who, who believe this is true. And as I said, people have different feelings. And I'd like to get a feeling for the audience before I begin just to, to know who we're talking to. How many of you would say that you are disbelievers? I mean that you believe that it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This is it, and that's what it is. Please raise your hands. There's not one brave, oh one, we've got one brave person. Two? Two. We've got two brave people. Okay, great, okay. How many of you would say that you're agnostic? You're not sure one way or another you'd like to learn more? Okay, and how many of you would say that you believe, that you uh, know this is true? Okay, we've got a biased audience here. <laughs> and a friendly audience, at least to the data. Right. Um, by the way, how many of you have had a near-death experience? Fair enough. How many of you, by the way, have seen the movie Dragonfly? Ah, a number of you. What I would like to do is to start off by sharing with you a true story of my relationship to the movie Dragonfly, which both illustrates aspects, as you'll see, about how research on, current research on uh, survival of conscious death to death is conducted, how it affects one's personal life, and how it shows up in the strangest ways concerning even Hollywood movies. And here's the story. 
Um, it's in November, last November. I am packing to leave for a two-week trip to give a whole series of lectures, um, including going to La Costa in California to talk at a, a set of meetings that Deepak Chopra was holding. And it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I, had, and I got an email to check the, whatever emails I needed to take care of immediately. And there was an email from Janet from St. Louis, Missouri. Now, Janet is a housewife who is a, a medium. And a medium, as most of you probably know, is someone who believes that they can communicate with the deceased. Janet, on a regular basis, for over two years now, has been in communication with a deceased person whose name is Susie Smith. Have any of you heard of Susie Smith? A few of you? Okay. Well, Susie, quick story is that Susie, um, in her lifetime, published 30 books in the field of parapsychology and survival consciousness. Death. Susie had been a journalist, a cynic, who, in her, when she was in her 40s, her mother passed away. And Susie originally thought it was ashes to ashes. However, a couple of years later, Susie read a book called The Unobstructed Universe. Have any of you heard of that book? by Stuart Edward White. It's a really quite a remarkable book. And it's about, in part, the, the, the possible physics of the afterlife that was communicated, supposedly, by a medium who had died and now is sharing her experience on the other side. Um, so she read this book and was very taken with it. And so she took a walk out in the park with her little dachshund dog, Junior, and said to herself, and out, uh, maybe out loud, she said, Mother, if you're here, could you give me a sign? How do I know if you're still here? And as Susie reports it, she was overwhelmed by the presence of her mother. But Susie didn't know whether she was simply imagining this, whether this was wishful thinking, or whether her mother was really here. And so she decided to spend the rest of her life devoted to this topic. Anyway, Susie, um, I met Susie when she was 85 years old. She had been in a wheelchair for a number of years, a long, complicated story. But anyway, Susie became my adopted grandmother. She used to consider me her illegitimate grandson. Um, and she was fond of saying she, Susie couldn't wait to die so she could prove that she was still here. And Janet has played a very critical role in that, and I will share some of that research with you later. But every now and then, um, to, um, Janet will email me with messages from Susie. I'm going to give you the background. So this is last November. Susie's been dead now for almost two years. And anyway, I get this email from Janet and from Susie. And in the email, Janet says, Susie is showing me the movie Dragonfly. And she's saying this movie is very important. It's very important to you. And she says, you're going to be meeting somebody attached to this movie and it's going to be very important to you in the work. And I'm saying, I'm going to meet somebody from the movie Dragonfly. And you have to understand, first of all, Janet didn't know that I loved the movie Dragonfly. Number two is that in the almost two years that I've received emails from Janet, not once did she ever write anything about Dragonfly. And nor, by the way, in any of the research readings that I've had the privilege to be part of, over the past now seven or so years, has any medium ever spontaneously brought up the word dragonfly? So the word dragonfly stood out in my mind. So I'm saying to myself, who am I going to meet that's associated maybe with the book of dragonfly? Well, I did know, however, that I was about to meet a man who I knew nothing about, save for the fact that he's, he wrote music for movies. I didn't know what movies. But I knew that he wanted to meet with me because he and his wife had each had readings with Laurie Campbell, a little favorite leader, who was a research medium from Irvine, California. And after having read the Afterlife Experiments book, then having had these readings, he felt compelled to want to contact me. And Laurie did give him my phone number because I, if some of you, any of you have read the book, know that in my, in, uh, at an earlier time I used to be a, a jazz musician, played many instruments. And, he, of course, was a musician. So he wanted to meet me, and I was going to be meeting this man. And I said, I wonder whether or not this man's associated with the movie Dragonfly. 
So at about 6.10 in the morning, I went on, the, I was on email, I went on the web and looked up his name. His name is John Debney. And as I looked through the list of credits in the movie, sure enough, guess who wrote the music for Dragonfly? John Debney. So of course, I'm really touched him. From a medium in St. Louis, Missouri, supposedly from my adopted grandmother, I'm learning that I'm about to meet the man who wrote the music for one of my favorite movies. Okay. Well, it gets worse because I'm, I, you know, I'm packing. I have to leave, and I have to pay bills and stuff, and I don't do that all that regularly. Every you know, few weeks, and the mail piles up in my mailbox, so I go out to the mailbox to get the last four or five days of the mail, and I go into the mailbox, and there is this big, fairly fat, gold bubbled envelope. Gold bubbled envelope. I've never seen such an envelope. Very dramatic envelope. And I look at this envelope, and it's from John Debney. Turned out that he, uh, a week earlier, decided, as a surprise, to send me some of his CDs. I open up the envelope, and there are six CDs, and one of the movies of the CD is Dragonfly. So, with some tears in my eyes, I put on that CD and wondered about it. The miracle of all of this. Well, it gets much more interesting. Why? If you remember, if you saw the movie Dragonfly, the movie is about a husband and wife, both physicians. The wife is pregnant, and she goes off to, uh, to some area in South America, I can't remember, um, to, uh, to, to work with some children. And in the process, uh, the uh, bus with the children and her overturn and uh, go down the go down the hill and go the water and uh, the, uh, they will die. And uh, the husband, of course, was devastated by the loss of his wife, daughter, and that um, he had made a promise to his wife that he was going to take care of her pediatric patients. He had, she was a pediatric oncologist. So he went to the ward, and these kids, by the way, as the movie portrays, they often have near-death out-of-body experiences. And what was interesting is that some of these kids were claiming that when they had their near-death out-of-body experiences, they were receiving communication from a deceased doctor who had a message for her husband. A desperate message. I'm not going to give away the movie for those who have seen it. And, um, it's a pretty spectacular claim of a movie, right? Well, I did ultimately meet John Denton. He was a very special I come home from this meeting, and the next night I am having dinner with a colleague. I get there early, and there's a Starbucks or something. There's a Starbucks near the restaurant. And there's an outdoor table, and there are three women and a gigantic Great Dane. One of the biggest animals I've ever seen. Now, I love animals. I love dogs. And there's this huge Great Dane. And of course, I had to go over and say I love this Great Dane. <laughs> so I did. And um, the, the Great Dane was beside himself with joy, which was surprising apparently to the women because this dog had been abused. And he was very shy with men. But for some reason, he wasn't shy with me. So of course, I'm cuddling the dog and asking him and, and saying I'm to get the dog and so forth. And, they asked, who am I? And I said, my name is Gary Schwartz. And the, and the woman, who turns out to be the mother of the daughter, went to the dog, says, you're Gary Schwartz. She said, you wrote the book, The Air Flight Experiment. And I said, yes. She said, well, I read that book. She said, I work at Canyon Ranch. I said, oh, how wonderful to meet you. And then she says, I've got a friend who's had an experience which is more dramatic than any experience you wrote about in your book. And she's been desperately wanting to tell you the story, but she's been afraid to. She's even written it. I said, really? I said, well, tell not to be afraid. Here's my cell phone. Have her call me the next day. And she did. And she told me the following story. And by the way, this story has been verified. I subsequently invited her and her husband to my house, as well as the surgeon, uh, who, in, who I will tell you about. And I interviewed them for three hours. I have this all on tape. So what I'm about to tell you is, is something that really happened. Here's her story. 
She also works at Canyon Ranch, this woman, and she had carpal tunnel syndrome in her wrist, and she went to have an operation. And, she, and they gave her some sort of a, a local anesthetic, and she's lying down, and she had an allergic reaction, her breathing stopped, she went into seizures. And the way her husband describes it was that she was looking there, and he looked into her eyes, and she was gone. They were ultimately able to resuscitate her and bring her back and stabilized, and then decided to do the surgery. Now, of course, she couldn't tell anyone when this then because she had been out. But during this period of time, she had a near-death out-of-body experience. And she remembered much of it. She remembered you know, the tunnel and the light and so on. But that was all that she remembered. Well, they did the surgery. The surgery was uneventful except for one amazing event, which she was told about after when she woke up, the primary surgeon. And he told her, that after the surgery, she woke up and said something to one of the surgeons, which led him to go into tears, and he fled the room. She, however, did not ask what it was that she said. She had no memory for this. And the reason she didn't ask was because she was so overwhelmed by remembering that she had this near-death experience that she couldn't comprehend it. She wasn't worth thinking about what happened to this surgeon. So she goes home and has to try to integrate this experience. A year later, she sees the movie Dragonfly. And she realizes that it's possible, if this movie is correct, that when you have a near-death experience, you might meet somebody who's previously died. She begins to wonder, did she have an experience like these kids did? So she contract contacted her primary surgeon, and said, would you give me the name of the man who I said this to, to find out what happened? He gave her the name of the man. She called the man, and he told her the following story. She's had the surgery. There were seven people in the room. They're all wearing masks and gloves. She's lying down. She's coming out of the anesthetic. All of a sudden, she sits up, and she points to a man, and in, in one of the men with the, with the mask on, she says, I've met a woman, her name is Anna, and she says she has a message for you. She wants me to tell you that it's not your fault that she died. And then she fell back and went to sleep. <laughs> Now, why was that important? Because it turned out that this man had a wife whose name was Anna. She was dying from some sort of cancer. She was very depressed, and she decided to commit suicide. She slit her throat, and he found her, and he couldn't save her. And he always felt guilty for being unable to prevent her. Now, it's one thing to have an emotional attachment to a TV, I mean, from a, you know, a movie. It's another thing to, after meeting the man who wrote the music for this movie, to then meet someone who had a real life experience that happens to directly be consistent with a book that you published on the actual experience. And if you can imagine how I felt hearing that story, you can begin to ponder it. Um, this work, this research, not only affects you know, a scientist in his academic life, um, if you're open to receiving the information, it affects you personally as well. And um, I'm going to share one more recent example, again, of something that is consistent with the way we do research, which also honors a man 
whose parents live in Chicago. Now, I don't know if this is the case. Is, are Jack's parents here? Okay. There was a possibility that they would come. I have not met them. There is a, a, a information about a book that's just about to be published, written by Jana Excel. And I've uh, shared the uh, information about this book for her. It's called um, Soul Light. And um, this is a book about a woman who is a grief counselor in Tucson who happened to also be a research sitter in one of the experiments that I will tell you about shortly. And this man, Jack, who grew up in Chicago and eventually moved to Tucson, which is where she met him, Jack was very significant in Jan's life, and information about Jack came through in the readings, and is described in, the, um, this, in one of the chapters called the Canyon Ranch Experiments that was done at Canyon Ranch. Um, in fact, at one point, the medium said that, that, that Jack was showing his, uh, his uh, a black leather motorcycle jacket. And the irony was that literally, Jana had brought his jacket to the reading. And no, the mediums could not see, were not allowed to see the sitter. Um, and so therefore, they had no way of knowing that, uh, that she had brought this special jacket. But what I want to tell you about, again, is equally amazing and absolutely true. And I want you to ponder what this means when we can do this scientifically. And here's the story. And by the way, I, I shared this particular story with, a, with an honors group of students at the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago Circle partly because I want to make sure that if I'm in Chicago, the least I can do is honor and thank Jack. Here's the, here's the situation. It's last, this past February. I am, it's a Thursday, and the following Monday, I am going to be giving a talk at a local church um, on the afterlife experiments and honoring the late Susie Smith, my adopted grandmother, who happened to have been a member of this particular church. And th the Thursday morning, before that Monday that I'm to give this talk, I receive an email from Janet, again Janet in St. Louis, Missouri, purportedly from Susie, my adopted grandmother. And in the email, there is a warning from Susie, a warning. And she tells me that someone, who will remain nameless, had been saying derogatory things about me and the work, and that this was a potentially uh, uh, serious problem. And I read this and I said, who do I know would be saying potentially derogatory things about me and this work, and why would this show up in an email? That afternoon, I received a phone call out of the blue from Jana Excel, who's calling on behalf of one of the members of the church, and they're calling to confirm that I'm actually going to follow through and give this talk. I said, well, why are they asking you to call me about this talk? And she said, because Person X has been saying derogatory things about you and the work. And also, this person has been saying derogatory things about me. And I said, wow. I said, that's amazing. She was expecting me to be all upset. I'm absolutely amazed. Because here in the morning, I get an email out of the blue, you know, from my adopted deceased grandmother warning me of such a thing. And now I've got evidence. That something's happening. You remember, I'm a scientist, so you know, I'm always looking for data. It's, it's the problem that we scientists have. <laughs> so, but of course, I was really seriously concerned about this. So I said, okay, Jenna, I said, I think that, well, if, you, if it makes sense to you, is that I think I'd like to see the minister of the church and find out exactly what's being said. And I said, if, by the way, if this material was true, I wouldn't want this minister to invite me to give a talk, and I would 
myself want to give a talk, so I, I wanted to resolve the, where this was coming from. Um, and she thought that was a wonderful idea. And then she said something to be very interesting. She said, Gary, she says, I want you to know something. She said, not only is Susie going to protect you, but I want you to remember that my Jack is going to protect you, too. Now, Jana is something of a medium herself, at least with her loved one, Jack. But again, me being a scientist, I say, how do I know, Jana, that your Jack is actually currently with you and that, uh, that he is available for this role? I said, let's do an experiment. And of course, Janet was participated in the experiment, thought it was a great idea. So I said, I'm going to email Janet tomorrow in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm going to tell Janet that Susie is bringing along a friend. Remember, Susie's now supposedly with Jack, and they're looking over me. So I said, OK, I'm asking J Susie and Jack, if you're listening to our telephone conversation, that tomorrow, that Janet's going, to, uh, Janet's going to ask Susie to bring this person. I don't say who this person is. And then Janet's going to do a reading on this other deceased person. We call this the double deceased paradox. <laughs> One deceased person brings another deceased person to a given reading. <laughs> and then we'll get this information. And then we'll see. Well, and then you'll score this information, Janet, and tell me whether this fits Jack. So, of course, that morning I emailed Janet and asked her to contact Susie, that Susie's going to be bringing this, a deceased person along, and can you get information? So, Jan Janet does this. She sends me the email. I forward it to Janet. Janet does a detailed scoring from minus three to plus three, where minus three is a complete miss, minus two is a probable miss, minus one is a possible miss. Zero is, it could be yes, could be no, plus one's possible hit, plus two probable hit, plus three is a definite hit. And if you don't know the answer, you don't know how to rate it because you don't have the information, you'll leave it blank. Okay? Well, Janet was able to score about 60% of the information. But she knew she, she could judge the information. And it turned out that all of that information, that 60%, was accurate. The other 40%, she didn't know. So she got 60% correct of all the total number of items, which is actually quite high. But the other 40% you couldn't read. Well, I said, great, John. I said, that's, that's fine. That's very meaningful. Um, and that's the data. And at least we know that it looks like that there's something going on here. Then coincidence happens. Sunday afternoon, who calls Jana out of the blue? But Jack's parents from Chicago. And Janet says, oh, what a wonderful coincidence. She said, could I ask you if you would be willing to listen to this material? And she tells him about this experiment now that she didn't talk. And would they be if she would be willing to score the information? And the parents were now open to all of this. They said, sure. They scored the information. And they were able, they were able to recognize about 70% of the information. 70% they knew, 30% they didn't. But the 70% that they knew, they rated it all accurately. When Janet then took the information that she knew that the parents didn't know, and she took the information that the parents knew that she didn't know, and she put it all together, the accuracy for this reading was 100%. Now, this is the first time in all the years of doing research that a given reading had been scored 100% accurate. It was also the first time that we had ever had the opportunity to have multiple family members and friends score the same reading and therefore be able to pool their knowledge. Okay? Because different people know different things to discover whether the accuracy would increase or not. So now I've got a problem. Because the data are too good. So I said, John, I said, I can't these data. I said, I've got to have some sort of way of knowing that this is really Jack and that Jack is sort of really around me. So I said in my head, and uh, as well as out loud to Jana, I said, if Jack's really listening to this conversation, 
what I'm asking Jack to do is tomorrow, Monday morning, to spontaneously show up with Janet, yes. to quote, drop in, no warning, no, you know, me asking Janet to have Susie bring a deceased person. He should just spontaneously drop into the reading and give a piece of information that will let me know that he's really watching. Next morning, Monday morning, I get an email from Janet. And partway through the reading, it says, there's a man who's come through um, with Susie. The man has come through with Susie, and he's showing me a policeman. It's a policeman. And she said, he's not saying that you're going to get a ticket or that you're going to jail. What he's showing you, what he's saying is that he's there to protect you. Anybody want to guess what Jack's profession was when he was in Chicago? <laughs> He was a policeman. He was a cop. Right. I took that as a meaningful piece of information. And that night when uh, I gave my talk honoring Susie, I shared this special story. Um, truth is, these things really happen. Um, and the fact that I'm telling you these kinds of stories illustrates the extent to which this research is evolving since, uh, since it began. I'm going to take you backward in time now a bit and just share with you some of the early experiments that we've done so you can understand the context of how actual research is conducted. Okay? And we'll go through a couple of examples. And then I'll share with you some of the latest research. And then we can talk about what might all of this mean if this search continues to be true? Um, I've been blessed, and I and my colleagues have been blessed, to work with what we call uh, Michael Jordan's and the Mediumship Book. And uh, most of you know who Michael Jordan is, right? He's one of the world's great baseball players. <laughs> no? Basketball. But did he play baseball? Yeah. yeah. Was he very good? No. no. But he was terrible. Right? But he was a pretty good basketball player, right? Anybody know what his average accuracy was when he was shooting from the floor? No, not sixty. No. About forty-five percent. He actually his average was around forty-five percent. On a good game, he might get sixty or seventy percent. Bad game, he might get twenty percent. Here's a question: How can somebody who, on the average, is missing more than fifty percent of his shots? Be a superstar? The answer is very simple. All he has to do is to be better than everybody else and play by the rules of the game. Okay? Same thing if you want to be a Michael Jordan in the media bro. If you want to be a Michael Jordan, you don't have to be perfect. In fact, you can miss more than 50% of your shots. And not only that, we know if you're a Michael Jordan that on some days with some teams you're going to do really well and on other days you're not going to do well. But if you're going to be a Michael Jordan of the mediumship world, all you have to do is on the average be better than everybody else and play by the rules of the game. Meaning, no fraud, no cold reading, no wild guessing, none of the tricks that the skeptics always accuse the mediums of doing. Every one of the mediums that I've had the privilege of working with Almost always, they do not get 100%. In fact, they're, you know, in many of our experiments, they might average 50 to 60% average. But they're much, much better than what the average person would do, or what chance performance would do. They're better than everybody else. Second thing about Michael Jordan is that what Michael Jordan does is every now and then he dazzles us, right? You know, he's at half court through a sea of arms and he makes an amazing three point shot. Or he's, you know, he's, a, he's a, just around the three-point line and he jumps up in the air and he hovers in the air, right? And he just makes one of those impossible shots. If you want to be a Michael Jordan of the media world, what you've also got to do is you've got to dazzle us. You've got to make shots that are just absolutely jaw-dropping. Every one of the mediums that I've had the privilege to work with, not only, of course, do they tell me stories 
about dazzle shots, but they've all done dazzle shots in the laboratory. I'll give you some examples in a second. Third thing about Michael Jordan is, you know, that if you put him on the court, you let him play the game his way, and for example, you just let him go up and just dump shots, for example. He's going to get most of them in, right? Nobody else in the court. On the other hand, I can't say, I'll say, okay, Michael, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand at one end of the court and shoot baskets at the other end. How many is he going to get in? Virtually none, right? But it's a take-home message. Just because he's a superstar doesn't mean he's a superman. There are some things he can do and there are some things he can't do. And by learning what he can do and what he can't do, it helps us understand how the game is played, right? Now imagine you're a scientist and you're a skeptic about basketball. You're a skeptic about Michael Jordan, you're a skeptic about basketball. And so you come in and you say, okay, Mike, I'm going to test you. I'm going to let you come in and play in my, in my, on my court. He says, but I want you to know, in my court, you're not allowed to jump. You think Michael Jordan's ever going to show that he's a superstar if we don't let him jump? Of course not. If you allow Michael Jordan to show you how good he is, the first thing you have to do is let him play the game his way. Once he's shown you the optimal way that he can play his game, then you can say, okay, Michael, can you do it without jumping? Can you do it with your left hand? Can you do it with your right hand? Can you do it at 20 feet? Can you do it with 33? You can then manipulate the variables. But initially, what do you want to do when you start? You want to give him an optimal condition for showing what he does as long as he plays by the rules of the game. The reason why many of these mediums have agreed to come to our laboratory is because we were going to give them the opportunity to play the game their way. We were going to provide them with a home court advantage. We were going to provide them with energy and enthusiasm for doing the best they could as long as they played by the rules of the game. You got it? That's a philosophy. Now, we've done a lot of experiments, and there are many of them described in the F5 experiments book. Let me just give you one example of one of my favorite sort of uh, turning point experiments that illustrate um, how um, uh, both complicated and fun this research can be, and also to be prepared for surprises. To be prepared for surprises. And constantly what happens is they show up that you don't anticipate. Okay. Here's the experiment. I'm going to try to get up because it's and move around a little bit. Um, imagine that this is the way it is. You've got a medium. There are three mediums. There's John Edward. How many have heard of John Edward? Have you seen him on television? Yes. Okay. Um, how many believe that he's for real, by the way? Raise your hands. How many question whether he's real? Raise your hands. How many think he's not real? Raise your hands. Could be at least one honest person here. Okay. Um, I saw it. I worked with John before he was on television. And I worked with him in the laboratory. People ask me, is John for real on television? My response is, I don't know. I don't have control over what he does on television. All I can speak to is what he did in the laboratory. And in the laboratory, he's the real deal. And you'll see why. Um, we have three mediums, John Edwards, Suzanne Rutherford, and Lauren Campbell. We have five sitters. These are research sitters, meaning that they've been selected because they're research-oriented, they're trained how to score the data before they're in the experiment, and the other thing is that they've agreed to score every single item, initial name, historical fact, personal description, temperament, and so on, not only for the three readings they're going to have, but they're going to score it for the 12 readings that everybody else is doing. Why? Because we want to find out whether the information is specific to your reading. If you're the sitter, we want to know that the information we get for you belongs to you and not to you, and vice versa. We want to know whether it's general and applies to everybody or specific and applies to the individual. Right? It's a lot of scoring. It took them over 20 hours to do that. Um, they, there are three experimenters. There's three separate rooms run simultaneously. The sitters are sequestered in a separate area. John is sitting facing the wall with his back to the door. He's facing a movie camera, video camera, and a backup audio tape recorder. And behind John is a floor-to-ceiling double-sheeted uh, shield. So that even if John turned around to look at the sitter and the experimenter, he couldn't see them because there was a shield. And we know he didn't turn around because we had the video camera going. Okay? So this eliminated all visual cues. 
Can't see nods, smiles, no non-verbal vision. We bring in a sitter. Um, I was the experimenter with John. The sitter sits down, and she doesn't say a word. Doesn't say a word. And in the first part of the experiment, I say, okay, John, for the next 10 minutes, what I want you to do is get whatever information you can about the person who's sitting behind you, and you're not allowed to ask any questions. So he never knows the age, the sex, the tone of voice, the race of the sitter. He's not allowed to get any feedback, verbal feedback. He's just got to share, quote, what spirit is giving him. You got it? And he does that for about 10 minutes. Then in part two, it's more like a normal reading. John's allowed to ask certain questions. And he can ask a question to get verification of information. However, the sitter is not allowed to respond, to talk. What the sitter does is she shakes her head yes or no, and the experimenter says yes or no. So the only voice that John ever hears is the voice of the experimenter. You with me? The only voice he hears is the voice of the experimenter. And uh, the experimenter knows next to nothing about the deceased history of the sitter. So we're blind as much as possible to the history of these people. Now, very important part of this experiment is that the order of which sitter would see which medium was done just before the experiment <coughs> began. Why was that done? Because we wanted to rule out any possibility of fraud. And this did it for the following way. Imagine you're, uh, you, you're, you know, you're John Edward, and you don't want to get information ahead of time. So what you do is you tap my phones. You tap the phones of the lab. You've got detectives. You figure out who the research sitters are. You go on the web and so on, and you get information. Okay, now you've memorized all this information about the five sitters. You got it? You know it now. However, you're sitting in a room here. You don't know who's sitting behind you. And the order with which which person comes in is not determined until just before the experiment. So now the first person sits down. You're not allowed to ask any questions. How do you know which information to use? You've got a real problem. And if you simply pull a little of this and a little of that plus all five, it's going to wash out and give you zero because everybody's scoring all the information for all the readings. <laughs> So what you do when you do this research is you attempt to be as clever as you can about ruling out ways in which fraud might occur. You got, the, you got the point? So what happens in an experiment like this? Well, the best way to understand the data is to share it with you and to have you participate. And not only that, as I said, you have to be prepared for surprises. Are you ready? What I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you some examples. I'm going to have you raise your hands to tell me if the information applies to you or not. I should tell you that I've done this all with almost 12,000 people now at this particular thing, because I keep collecting data whenever I, I give a talk to a new audience about this, to keep collecting information to see what the results are. Okay? It's center number three. The medium is John Edward. I'm the experiment. The sitter sits down. John begins, and John says, he says, I'm, I'm sensing that there's a, there's a deceased grandmother. The, the sitter has a deceased grandmother. How many of you have a deceased grandmother? Raise your hands. <laughs> right. That's a pretty safe bet. Um, you know, so on, right? So if you were doing cold reading, you know, that's a good one. But it also doesn't discriminate. It doesn't help you very much. And then John says, he says, oh, he says the grandmother's showing me that she really loved the sitter. She really loved the sitter. How many of your grandmothers really loved you? Raise your hand. That <laughs> also fits most people, right? Then John says, he says, oh, he says, the grandmother's showing me that she brought daisies to the wedding. Daisies to the wedding, he said. How many of your grandmothers brought daisies to her daughter's wedding? Raise your hand. Look around the room. Nobody. It turned out that thus far, three people out of 12,000, probably 12,000 now, have raised their hands to that. 
I later learned from the sitter that not only did her grandmother bring daisies to her mother's wedding, she wove them in her mother's hair. So this was a significant piece of information. Then John says, ah, and the grandmother's showing me that she had two dogs, two large dogs, he says, in fact, poodles, a black one and a white one, and the white one tore up the house. <laughs> How many of you had a grandmother who had two dogs? <laughs> two uh, large dogs, black dogs, I mean, poodles, in fact, a white one and a black one, and a white one tore up the house. Raise your hands. Look around the room. Right. It's not a common response. Well, John got over 70% accurate for this particular sitter when the information was later scored, and that was not the surprise. It's good. That's quintessential John Edward, okay? That's what happens over and over in the laboratory. I bring, I take out sitter number three, I'm going to run to sitter number four right now. Sitter number four comes in. She sits down, and John says, hmm, he says, I'm hearing the song of the Good Ship Line. And then he says, hmm, he says, I'm, I'm hearing Sabrina, Sabrina's a teenage witch. And then he says to me, he says, Gary, come on, you can talk to me. He said, Gary, he said, um, did you bring in a sitter? I said, what do you mean? I said, yes, I brought in a sitter. He brought the thing in. He said, I, well, he said, I have a problem. I said, what do you mean you have a problem? He says, uh, I can't get anything for this sitter. I said, what? What do you mean you can't get anything for the sitter? If you can't get anything for the sitter, that means you get a zero for this person. You get a zero, it's going to bring down your average. <laughs> you've, only got, you've only got five readings today. If one of your readings is zero percent. It's not good. He said, Gary, he said, I, can't, I, have pro I can't do it. So I said, what's the problem, John? He said, the previous sitter's grandmother is still here. I said, excuse me? Uh, John said, he said, you mark my words. He said, I'm, he said, I have the sense that this sitter is still waiting to see another medium, and that's why the grandmother's here. Now remember, there were five sitters, there were three mediums, which meant that at any one time, at least two of the sitters were waiting to see another medium, okay? I said, okay, John. And then he said to me, and I couldn't verify this, he said, also he says, Gary, says, I think the grandmother likes me. <laughs> I said, okay, John, fine. Um, so you get a zero. That's it. And then he said, Gary, can I do the yes-no period? I said, why do you want to do the yes-no period? You already got a zero. He said, I want to be sure that, in fact, this doesn't apply to the sitter. Moreover, I want to make sure it doesn't apply to you. Now, why did he say that? You see, John is an evidence-based medium. This is a guy who's a bulldog for facts. And the only way he ever knows whether he's right or not is to get feedback. So this is a way that he can check his own accuracy. And that's the way you develop skill in this area. You've got to do it through trial and error and learn the process. So I said, OK, John. So he asked me, he said, he said Gary, yes, the sitter is the, the, the good ship lollipop meeting to her. She shakes her head, no. And so I said, no. And he said, what about you, Gary? I didn't even know who sang on the Good Ship Lollipop. Anybody know? Holy <laughs> Temple, right. So I learned. Um, and then he says, uh, okay, what about uh, the, uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch? I asked, you know, Senator shakes his head, no, I say no. He said, what about you, Gary? Well, none of my deceased relatives have anything to do with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. So John got zero. He got zero. I took Sitter number four back. And who is waiting? Just as he said. But sitter number three. So I sit down next to sitter number three and I said, excuse me, can I ask you a couple of questions? She said, sure. I said, does a good ship lollipop mean anything to you? And she broke into tears. Why? Because when she had been a little girl, she had had curly brown hair. And she used to sing and dance Shirley Temple songs for her grandmother. She didn't remember if she had sang on the Bishop Lollipop. She later called her mother, who was a professor at the University of Arizona, to discover, sure enough, that she in fact had sang on the Bishop Lollipop. Anybody want to guess what the sitter's name is? Sabrina. Sabrina. <laughs> and when she had been a teenager, some kids had teased her. 
and called her Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And guess who she went to for solace? That grandma. Now that's a gospel shot. Right? And it's very hard how to explain that surprise, not only in terms of conventional explanations like fraud or cold reading or greater bias or guessing or, or any of the conventional or even experimental error or experimental bias. It's very hard to explain it that way. Also, it's very hard to explain by any of the alternative paranormal explanations such as reading the mind of the sitter. It sounds like survival of consciousness, doesn't it? It sounds like Sabrina's grandmother was really there. Well, we have a motto on the left, which is, it's going to get worse before it gets even worse. <laughs> And I say that affectionately, uh, still my students hate that motto, because um, <laughs> not just because we're going to get in more trouble, but because when you open the doorway to this research, you allow for more surprises to come. And at this point, to tell you the truth to a friendly audience, the best experiments are being suggested from the other side. They know more than we do. And let me just give you an example about how one of the latest paradigms is emerging. Emerged. The, uh, Susie Smith died on February 11, 2001. She was preparing to celebrate her 90th birthday party. She was in Although she was you know, very old, in a wheelchair and so on, she seemed in good health. She had an unanticipated massive heart attack and died. I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And I never had a chance to ask her all the questions that I wished I could have asked her or have been brave enough to ask her, given all the experience she had in this work. And that Sunday night when I learned this, I became more than just a scientist observing others having loved ones who died. I decided I was going to become a secret sitter. In these single blind and then double blind experiments, and I wanted to find out whether my deceased lover was going to come through or not. And I asked my then research partner, uh, Linda Russick, who launched me inspired me to actively involved with his work, I asked her if she would call Lori Campbell and arrange for a one of our double blind readings to take place. We had started an experiment now where Lori would do a reading and where the sitter would not be present. The sitter would be there ahead of time we know who the sitter was and the sitter would agree to do it. But the, uh, the sitter would not hear the reading at the time that Lori did it, and Lori would do it over the telephone, and the sitter not only could not Lori answer the questions, but the sitter wouldn't hear the reading when it took place. Then afterwards, what we would do is send the, the, the sitter the transcript of the reading, plus a transcript of somebody else's reading, but you wouldn't know which was yours. And then you would score each of them, but you'd be blind to which was which. Okay, so we were doing this kind of experiment. So I asked Linda to call Lori to schedule a reading, only I lied. Number one, the secret sitter was going to be me. And number two, I was not about to do a double blind. I wanted to listen in when Lori was doing the reading. I never said anything, but I wanted to listen. Okay? Well, Lori did this reading, and she got about 25 pieces of information about this older woman who recently died. And the information that she got was very heartwarming and amazing. Three pieces of information I will never forget because she said the following. She said, this woman, she didn't get the woman's name. She said, this woman is showing me that she's doing three things that are very important. She said, number one, she's showing me that she's dancing with an elderly gentleman. 
Now, why is that important? Because I knew that what Susie had told me was that when she died, her first dream was to spend the next year in the afterlife dancing with Professor William James. <laughs> well, she claimed that she'd been in contact with him many years. No, she'd been in a wheelchair for almost 20 years. So for Laurie to be seen, Susie <laughs> dancing with a gentleman who's elderly gentleman was a piece of information. The second thing she said was that Susie's showing me that she's holding a young child. Now, by the way, all the research readings that I've heard, I'd never heard of very early on a deceased person holding a baby child, showing that they're holding a baby child. Well, you see, Susie was only married for a few years. She never had children. And she, her plan was that when she died, she was going to adopt a child and raise children who had died. And the third thing that Lori said was, she said that this woman is insistent that she's going to be very active in the research. And I don't understand this. Who is this sitter? <laughs> Well, if it was going to be Susie, there's no question about it that she was not going to give up this work. All right, well, so we began collecting data. I did a whole series of readings with multiple mediums, found evidence that was consistent with Susie being here. And then a few months later, I get this email from this woman out of the blue in Salt Lake City, Missouri. I've already mentioned her, her name is Janet. But what I didn't tell you was how Janet contacted me. Out of the blue, I got an email from this woman, Janet, who's a medium in St. Louis, Missouri, a very quiet one, who is embarrassed to tell me uh, that, uh, and she was, really, she was very shy about this. She said, I, I don't know if this makes sense or not. She says, but this dead lady has showed up in my house. <laughs> and she's you know, pointing to your book, and she says that, uh, that uh, uh, she has a message for you. And, um, and I said, maybe this is Susie. And so, of course, I, being an experimenter, uh, you know, and I said, OK, how do we go about finding out whether this really is Susie and when she's really showing up for this woman? And as I listed them and looked at what Janet was writing reportedly from Susie, I saw there were two kinds of information. One kind of information is that Janet was describing what Susie was seeing taking place in my present life in the past 24 hours. The second thing was that Susie was giving warnings or about things that were going to happen in the future. It was no simple it was a warning, which was making a prediction. So I said, okay, Janet, I said, if Susie's really with you, let's do an experiment. Every day, five days a week, what I want you to do is to please contact Susie and ask her two questions. What does she see happening in the previous 24 hours? What happened to, to me? And secondly, what's going to have to be in the next 24 hours. And we would do this day after day, and then I'll give you feedback and let you know what was accurate and what was inaccurate. And we did this for the next few months, and the results were amazing, absolutely amazing. And I've now collected over 300 emails of this daily information, and it's going to appear in a book someday. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. I'll give you an example that I haven't mentioned before in one of the previous groups. That I was... Uh, one morning, I, I got up and was on a computer, and I was in New York City, and I hadn't told Janet that I had gone to New York, because I don't tell Janet where I'm going, just to see whether or not it shows up in reading. And uh, I got my email, and I get this email, and, and Janet says, Susie's showing me something strange. She says, she's showing me this big, tall building with lots of steps and lots of columns, she said, and it looks like like a, uh, she said, like a judicial building. And as I'm reading that, I look out the window, and where I was at that very moment was a desk on 82nd Street and 5th Avenue, in the apartment, looking into the front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> and if you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, what does it look like? A lot of steps, tall columns, if you didn't know, you might think it was that kind of thing happened all the time. But that's not the surprise. The surprise is crazy. Crazy making. And I said, I mean that every now and then. It just makes me really think. I was in New York on another trip and um, meeting with a woman whose 
younger sister, three years younger, who had been a very well-known surgeon in Colorado, had died of cancer. And she and her family were deeply depressed. They were Holocaust survivors, as her parents were Holocaust survivors. And the whole issue of death was very profound to them. And um, they drove me from their apartment in New York City to their home in the country, in, uh, outside of New York. And um, as she's telling me about her sister and her wish that she could know for real whether her sister was alive or not, I'm thinking to myself, how fortunate I am as a human being. I'm really lucky. Why? Because I can get on an email, and on a regular basis, I can get evidential information from my deceased loved one, from mediums in contact with Susie, right? And I'm feeling so blessed and feeling so badly for people, most of us who don't have this opportunity. Well, the next morning, which is Sunday, I'm back in New York City, and I go on my email, and there's an email from Janet. Now, Janet will talk to Susie on Monday through Fridays, but Saturday and Sunday is a weekend with her family. Okay? She doesn't kind of contact Susie on the weekend. She does the experiments on Monday through Friday. I don't get emails on the weekend. But there is this email on Sunday. And the email has the following amazing story. Are you sitting down? <laughs> the, uh, the email says, Gary, Saturday morning I was driving in my car, my new car, she's got a new car, she's got, and I'm in the car and Susie comes to me. And she's brought along this woman. I don't know who this woman is. And she says she insists that this woman has a message for her family and it's important that she communicate it. She said she wouldn't go away. So what did Janet do wisely? She pulled over to the side of the road <laughs> and then did a reading on this deceased woman. I guess if you see dead people, it can be distracting when you're driving. <laughs> Uh, so she does this, she sends the, and she emails, she says, Gary, she says, I don't know if this means anything. Well, she emails it to me, and I don't know if it means anything practically. I mean, I can pick out a few things that might relate to this woman. So I said, I wonder if this maybe relates to the sister of the woman I speak to before. So I called the woman in, the, in, her, in her country home. I said, look, the strange thing happened. I told her the story. I said, could I read you this email line by line and have you scored and see where this information fits? And we did, and over 80% of the information was accurate. The piece of information that I will never forget, uh, because it was so emotionally significant to me, I was ultimately able to see it on video, was partway through the email, Janet says, the sister, deceased sister, is showing me that eagles are very important to her. That the eagle is significant, and it's very important that the sister know, the living sister know, that she shared the eagle. And you have to understand, I've already had received, you know, at least 100 emails from, from Janet. Do you think she ever mentioned a bird, an eagle? Do you think in all of the research meetings, readings that I've done with John Edward and George Anderson and Suzanne Northup and Laurie Campbell and Ann Gaiman and others, that they spontaneously bring up that the deceased is showing me it's very important to give a message about an eagle? No. When I read that line to the woman, the sister, she broke into tears. Why? Because her sister's symbol was the eagle. The eagle was very important to her life. She collected photographs and art, statues of eagles. And when the sister died, the sister was cremated. Instead of putting the ashes at the front of the funeral parlor, what they did instead was they put one of her famous, favorite glass French statues of an eagle. And she sent me the video of the funeral service that showed that. Now when I saw this, my immediate response was, wow, what a great experimental paradigm, right? You have one dead person bring other dead people to different mediums. And then you have the information sent back by email, and it's done, you can have it scored double blind. I mean, this is a great experiment, right? By the way, in scientific jargon, what we call people like Susie and, and Kevin and other people who I, 
uh, in this role. We call them departed hypothesized co-investigators. <laughs> That's scientific jargon. So, um, of course, I was not about to just take Susie's idea and, uh, and immediately apply it in research. So we began to, uh, you know, pilot test it, so to speak. And my favorite example of one of the early ones was a physician and his wife. I, I met them in a meeting, actually, in Tucson. And they were, uh, they had multiple deceased losses. They were very interested in this work. And they wanted to know whether or not we could get any evidence about their deceased loved ones. And they lived in Phoenix. And I went up and visited them at one point. And, and um, I said, OK, I said, you know, what we could do is I could ask my deceased adopted grandmother, Susie Smith, to bring your deceased loved ones to Janet in St. Louis. She could then email this information, and then we'll see whether she gets any information that's right. The same thing that Susie had done initially with her sister. So I emailed Janet the next morning, and I said, Janet, I met a family. I don't say who. I don't say where. I said, they have deceased loved ones. I don't say, I don't say who the deceased loved ones are. I said, what I'd like you to do is contact Susie, talk to the deceased loved ones, write what you can get, and then I'll send the information on. We'll see if it's accurate. The next day, I got an email from Janet with all this information about multiple deceased loved ones. I have no idea if anything is accurate. I ship it to the uh, email it to the physician. He emails me back the second day, the next day with the following, you know, statement: "Re in the subject matter." And the subject, the sentence goes: "Janet is amazing. She's more accurate than my tax accountant." <laughs> <laughs> we have just completed. A multi-center, double-blind, double-deceased experiment. <laughs> now, the multi-center, double-blind is the gold standard in medical research. That's how we ultimately go about testing to know whether or not a drug is, in fact, uh, can have effects above and beyond expectation and experiment of belief and the like. Okay. Um, you do it in multiple places, you need to do it double blind. The double deceased part, of course, is, is really novel. And, um, <laughs> the, uh, and all I can say is that research, unfortunately, doesn't go away. Um, I have colleagues uh, who vary greatly in terms of their appreciation for this kind of work being done at the University of Arizona. In fact, as I affectionately tell people, some of my colleagues would prefer that I do this research somewhere else, preferably on another planet. <laughs> and one of my colleagues said to me, he said, you know, Gary, he said, you've gotten on this moving train, this fast moving train, and you can't get off. And what I said to him is, I said, you know, I said, if the data were negative, or the data were wishy-washy, I could get off the train, and I would. I said, but with the, when the data keep being strong, I have a moral and ethical responsibility to stand up for those data. We have a motto, which is, if it's real, it will be revealed, and if it's fake, we'll find a mistake. And the basic philosophy is, quote, let the data speak. However, Despite those kinds of attitudes, as you know, there are people who seriously question whether any of this is possible. In fact, we have groups of professional skeptics who make a lot of money and fame being in the role of debunker. And I used to believe that organizations like the Committee for the Scientific Explanation of Planes claims of the paranormal, called PSYCHOPs for short, that these organizations were really concerned with protecting the public, us, against the frauds and the, uh, the shysters. And by the way, there are frauds in this work. No question about that. And there are people who mean well also, but lousy what they do. Okay. However, is all of this fraud? Is all of this cold reading? Is all of this greater bias? Well, what controlled research says is absolutely not. And yet, there are those people who still insist that this is impossible. 
So when I, when I talk to an audience, and it doesn't matter who the audience is, they say, okay, Gary Schwartz, you've done all this research, you've met all these mediums, you've had all these personal experiences, and so on. They say, what do you believe? And I say, it's not important what I believe, it's, what's important is what I know. And let me tell you what I know. I know three things. Number one, I know that these data are real. They're real, they're replicable, they're found in multiple mediums, multiple sitters, multiple experimenters, multiple experiments. This is a real phenomenon. A very real phenomenon. The second thing I know is that when you look at the totality of the data, the data conducted in all of our experiments, the data that was, has been conducted now in, in Scotland with doing independently but parallel type experiments getting virtually identical results. And also when you look at the history of mediumship research over the past hundred years and you look at it honestly, with the totality of the data, the simplest and most parsimonious explanation that accounts for the largest amount of the data called Occam's Razor. What's the simplest explanation that explains all of it? is survival of consciousness. That's a fact. That doesn't mean it won't change in the future with new data or something, but right now, that's, that's the fact. And the third thing that I know is that we must be skeptics, skeptical of the super skeptics. Because my personal experience has been that people like James Randi and Michael Shermer and Paul Kurtz and so on, <coughs> who accuse the mediums of deceiving and cheating and so on. It's in fact those very people who engage in those deceitful practices of selectively ignoring the data that they don't like and, and falsely misrepresenting the information that they do like in order to paint a picture which unfortunately is inconsistent the reality of the data. And it's very upsetting. Anyway, how can someone say, stand up in a straight face, say, look, I'm telling you, I know this stuff is true, but I still have a hard time believing it. How can I know it's true and still not believe it? How many of you have heard of what's called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? Okay. Well, I have and I think many other people suffer from what I call PESD, which is a post-education stress disorder. <laughs> I was taught, and I was a really good student, and I had this classical condition response, Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, survival of consciousness after death. Okay? I hear survival of consciousness, I think stupid, I think superstitious, I think silly, I think sloppy, I think all of these negative words and I get in a lot of trouble if I stand up in an academic community. I mean, I had the privilege yesterday to, um, to share some of this research at the University of Illinois in Chicago Circle. And one of the things that I heard was that the uh, certain members in the psychology department were upset with the fact that um, this Dr. Schwartz was talking about this work, and he wanted, they wanted to make sure that it was clear that I was not speaking on behalf of the psychology department. <laughs> and by the way, it was the same thing with the philosophy department. You know, this is a... People are very, uh, you know, threatened by these kinds of data. And I think they're suffering from PESD too. They don't want to look at these data. Because if they do, we have to think about the world in a new way. Now, it's not new in the sense that this is a very old idea. You'll see it in the Bible, you'll see it in shamans. You'll see various forms right through, uh, throughout recorded history. But the implications of these findings ultimately affect all aspects of our lives, including science and education and politics and business. And, you know, we could spend hours talking about this. My favorite example is it relates to things in the legal system. Um, imagine for the moment that you were murdered. You were murdered. And, um, at, the, at your trial, different people are you know, witnesses of being called. Now, you were present at your murder. <laughs> and you know who murdered you. Are you allowed to testify? 
Imagine that we can have credible mediums on the <laughs> independently get information. Can that information be recorded in the records? Can the jury hear it? Well, not now, right now. Of course, I would say it's crazy. Second thing is, um, you know that the victims' rights in terms of the, uh, of the families and so on being able to have a say into what the punishment is, right? Should you, as the victim, in this case the deceased, be able to have some input in what kind of punishment the, uh, your assailant is to be provided? Let's say that you die and you have a, you have a will. And you leave money to a foundation, to your family in a certain way. And after you've died, you discover that people are not doing it actually the way you are. They're busy fighting over it and they want to use it for things that you don't want to use it. Do you have a right from the other side to uh, have some say to have your money being spent? <laughs> yeah, sure, right. Shouldn't we have that kind of a kind of role? Okay. What happens? You're a deceased scientist, okay? And you've done you know, a lot of work. So, I mean, you're now in contact with some mediums, scientists on the earth. And you come up with a really great idea for some technology uh, that uh, could make a lot of money. Can you be a co-owner of a patent? <laughs> Can you have some say into what's going to be done with your portion of the, uh, the borders? Are we going to have some corporation someday where 50% of the members of the board are deceased? <laughs> Sitting around the board table? Um, uh, yeah, what about marriages? Different kinds. It used to be till death do us part, right? <laughs> then, of course, we now have no fault divorce, and you know, uh, the whole issue of, of divorce has changed. But is there such a thing as, uh, as, uh, as marriages that might also uh, continue after, after life? I mean, do we need to reconsider what it means? Because what if death doesn't do us part? Should, we need to address these questions. I don't have any simple answers to these questions, but it's certainly important to raise them. And philosophically, it is profound. And finally, what kind of responsibility do we have, particularly to our children? Um, do you know why this work is done ultimately? What is the primary motive that would leave a, leave a mother or father Go to a month to go to a medium to hear about their deceased son or daughter. What's the primary motive that leads people to want to know about this phenomenon? Make what? Sure okay. What? Make sure they're okay. To make sure they're okay. And what's the, what's the general word that we talk about? It's love. love. It's basically this love. is all about love. And. If we are a parent and we really love a child, and our child really loves us, and that child is taken from us, for example, in a car accident, a plane crash, and the child wants to continue to be connected to us, and we wish to be continued to our child, do we have a right, number one, and do we have a responsibility, number two, to give some of our time and energy to our loved one, even though they're quote, physically gone? I must tell you personally, I think the answer is yes. I think that if, if love is what this is all about, then the whole issue of responsibility becomes expanded in our personal lives, our personal relationships. How we live our lives once we know 100% that you can't escape life. <laughs> death is not a way to escape life. Okay? When we call physical death is merely a transition. Then, not only do we have to feel like we have to get everything in this physical life, um, but also we can think in terms of developing relationships and developing our capacity to care that will not be limited by the constraints that we feel about now. Um, if I might share one more um, story before we then open this up for conversation. I want you to consider the following. And this is also a true story. And this is also an experiment. The follow-up is about to happen very shortly. 
There was a gentleman in Los Angeles by the name of John. He was in his November correctly, late 50s. He uh, was married, I think for a second time, had an 11 or 12 year old daughter. He was walking outside, he was a musician and uh, trained uh, many young musicians in Los Angeles. He was walking outside his house, was hit by a car, went into a coma, and uh, was completely paralyzed and unconscious. And the family didn't know what to do. The mother had a friend who was a medium. The medium spent time with John in a coma. He can't move, he can't talk. And the medium claimed that she was in communication with the man in the coma. Moreover, the medium claimed that John, who was a musician, wanted to write a song for his daughter. And uh, the medium was not a musician, but she could whistle to him, and she could certainly communicate lyrics. And so the medium and the, and the wife invited one of his students, 22-year-old guitarist, to come to the bedside and compose a song. Now it turned out that the daughter, the 22 year old, who was uh, not his daughter, but the young woman who was playing music, was the daughter of a friend of mine in Tucson. An osteopath and dentist. And one of his friends does documentaries and they decided they wanted to film this event, because this is somewhat unusual. And his question to me was, how do we know if this is real or not? How do we know if the medium's really talking to the consciousness of the man in the coma? How do we know whether or not this is really a song coming from the other side? So I said, well, what kind of evidence, what, is, what reason is there to believe that this might be true? So he starts telling me examples of evidential things. My favorite one was that at one point the, uh, in the evening, the wife learned that uh, a group of the physicians at the hospital were, to, were deciding about whether or not they were going to pull the plug. That they were, going to, that they were just going to um, you know, forcefully push him to let him go. And the wife was very upset about this, and she wanted to have, uh, be able to contact a brother or brother-in-law. I can't remember the exact relationship. It was late at night when she learned about this, because they were doing this on Kind of place, and um, she didn't have the phone number. She was going to have to drive 45 minutes back to the house, and then it was going to be late at night. Well, the medium says, John wants you to call such and such, and here's the phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and the medium rattles off the phone number, and it turned out it was the correct phone number. Now, in all my time thus far doing research with mediums, they've never reported a phone number. <laughs> They don't typically get addresses. They might say, I'm hearing the 27th of the month, but it's not 249-867-0531. Okay. So, of course, I was now intrigued by all of this. And so I went to Los Angeles and went to the foot of his bed. And it was, by the way, this is all documented with a, with a tech professional video. And what I did was, as an initial test, an initial test, of the medium's capacity to receive information is that I invited two deceased people to come with me. Um, one was Susie Smith, and the other was a young man who had recently died. And um, of course, I had to tell the medium who they were. And I said, "Look, I said, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, and you know that I'm here to evaluate this process." I said, "But I've invited two deceased people along. Could you please?" Uh, tell me who they are and give me some information that will let me know that they're here. And she passed the test. She passed the test. Well, they ultimately wrote these songs, and um, John ultimately died. And they've just received funding to do a documentary, a, a real, you know, finished documentary about this. And they wanted to come to Tucson to interview me and also to see whether we could do any research to verify all of this now that it was all over. And so we're doing the following experiment. First of all, two of the Michael Jordans in the mediumship world are going to be reading 
blindly, and if not, they don't know who the sitter is, they're going to be reading the, the wife. And the question is, number one, does a deceased man by the name of John come through? Does he indicate that he was in a coma? And does he indicate, provide evidence independently through both of these mediums that he was composing music to another person? Secondly, the medium is going to serve as a sitter with these two research mediums. We want to see whether the, the mediums will find evidence that John was in fact spending time with this woman. Again, spontaneously coming through. And third, I'm having this particular medium read a secret sitter who happens to be for another purpose flying in from Europe to evaluate in fact her ability to really serve objectively as a medium for someone that she herself doesn't know. And if those research terms turns out to yield positive evidence, and I underscore if, it would then provide us with ancillary data consistent with the hypothesis that this is true. Now imagine that if this is true as well. Imagine that what we call Alzheimer's, what we call senility, or, or when individuals are in comas, that the problem is not with consciousness. The problem is with the machinery for expressing the consciousness. Okay? The problem is not with the signal going to the cell phone. The problem is that the cell phone is not, not able to communicate the signal. Our bodies are machines. Our brains appear to be tools of consciousness. This works, correct? Not the source of the consciousness itself. Um, it's a great adventure, isn't it? And wouldn't it be nice if the, uh, the research were to continue to support the idea that um, all this and more is real? I must tell you that um, I'm trained to be offensive. I'm trained to be skeptical and questioning. And then what happens is I have a phenomenal experience. The data pushes me off the fence. And the next morning I climb back up the fence again. And up to a point, staying open, staying on the fence is very important, okay? And it's sometimes okay to move the fence and still be on the fence. But sometimes it's time to take the fence down. Every now and then, there are yes, no answers. And at some point, we need to reach that. Um, and how do we know when is enough evidence enough? Ultimately, that's an individual decision that each of us has to make <coughs> ourselves. I've really struggled with this. In fact, I've become much more interested, to tell you the truth, in the process by which we change our minds than even this question about should we change our mind about survival of consciousness that the answer is yes and maybe no. How we go about the process of changing our mind, coming to our beliefs, and being brave enough to change our minds is a very challenging thing for our species, and it may hinge on our capacity to survive and evolve. Um, I was in London this summer, and this spring. All-day conference sponsored by the Society for Psychical Research, which existed for over 100 years. And they, like a legal forum, and they had two people presenting evidence, contemporary evidence, consistent with survival, and they had two people who were, who were presenting the other side but, yeah, against it. And um, after I gave my presentation on research in the U.S., a very distinguished gentleman, psychiatrist, past president of the organization multiple times, gets up and he makes the following statement. He says, you know, he says, um, Dr. Schwartz has gone and has caused a bunch of great lengths to, uh, to uh, for example, remove, remove fraud. And he says, it's highly improbable that fraud can explain the totality of the research. However, he says, until Dr. Schwartz or some other scientist does an experiment that removes any possibility of fraud, I will not. I remain skeptical. And when 
I heard him say, until it removes any possibility of fraud, I was reminded of how a couple of years ago I realized that I could not des design a completely fraud, fraud proof experiment. Not that would remove any possibility of fraud. I mean, I could take mediums, and if I had enough money, I could put them in, lock them in jail, and I could have them watched by detectives, and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But the skeptic, and I mean me the skeptic, could say, but how do you know that the detectives weren't paid off and there wasn't somebody else monitoring the detectives and without monitoring the You know, how do you know? And the answer is, you're never 100% sure. There's always a little bit of doubt. And then I was reminded of the legal system. And our legal system, as you know, the decision of a jury about whether to convict or not, which means to put somebody behind bars and even potentially kill them, is beyond reasonable doubt. Not beyond any doubt. The status of this research at this point is not just beyond reasonable doubt. Almost everybody thinks that. It's beyond, far beyond reasonable doubt. It's not beyond any doubt, but it's far beyond reasonable doubt. Well, if you're far beyond reasonable doubt, what kind of doubt is left? Unreasonable doubt. Okay? And the question is, am I going to live my life as a person? let alone a scientist doing research on unreasonable doubt. If anything, what I should be doing is ask myself, where does this unreasonable doubt come from? Um, and so, I sympathize with the people who disbelieve, especially having been there myself. And I understand what it's like to be confused. Because in this area, the more we learn, the more questions are open. Remember, we've talked nothing here today about, quote, what's the afterlife like? Right now, we've been just talking about, is there evidence for an afterlife? There's a whole new, whole world that comes open to all of this. Um, so these kinds of questions about, about how do we know what, what we know, and also, what's the responsibility of sharing all this becomes very important. I'd like to end this with, a, with a, something I learned in the forward to a, a book written by Neil Grossman called Healing the Mind. The forward was written by Houston Smith. And in the beginning of this forward, this very beautiful forward, Houston tells a story about Neil when he, as a high school student, having read something in the, what was called the Dialogues in Plato. I, by the way, have not read the Dialogues in Plato nor that I even know the story. You have to explain it to me. But there was this quote, which I'm not going to get precisely right, but it had to do with the function of education. Function of education, which I think very much speaks to the function of science. And what he said, what essentially is said, and I may have the exact word wrong, I don't know now in transparency, but I don't know what it's called, it's called my PowerPoint, um, is um, that the purpose of education is to essentially bring true knowledge to souls who do not possess it. To bring true not knowledge to souls who do not possess it. As if inserting vision into blind eyes. As if inserting vision into blind eyes. And to paraphrase William Shakespeare, the challenge that we have as, as a species now is to see or not to see. <laughs> that is the question, <laughs> right? I think that one of the major roles for science should be to help us to see. The decision is for each of us about whether we are willing to see and we open to see. I think all of us, by the way, are capable of seeing. And once we open our eyes, boy, there's a whole new world of vision and color and beauty and opportunity that awaits us if, um, if all of this is true. I wish you all the very best and you now what questions would I have? Yes. Was it ever attempted for a medium to get information from a deceased person who spoke a different language and be able to understand it? Ah, good. Two great questions. First of all, has there ever been an attempt by mediums to contact people with different languages? 
We've not done this deliberately as an experiment, which, is, which needs to be done. But what has ha happened is that every now and again, uh, a deceased person will come through from a, diff from a different country, from a different language. Often when mediums, our mediums do this, what they do is they see and they have feelings. And every now and then, like someone like Lori Campbell, she'll pronounce funny things. Okay? What is interesting in the development of mediumship is that Lori Campbell initially didn't get any names originally when I first started working with her. Long time we now not only does she get first names and sometimes last names, but she now can pronounce names in foreign languages that can then be verified to be no. So I think the answer is in principle, the answer is yes. Also, Janet, just for the record, and this is truly amusing, totally wacko, okay? I didn't say this. <laughs> I will deny it. No, I mean, I'm saying it. But, um, Janet speaks a language fluidly that makes no sense to her. Um, and for it took her eight years to discover what the language was. And now we're, we're doing, we've just finished our first experiment with her, with, with the language where she was talking to the dead people who speak this language. The language, coincidentally, happens to be the language that was spoken by the tribe in Dragonfly. Um, <laughs> woo woo. <laughs> it's called Yan, Yan, Yanamami or Yanamala. Or I can't pronounce the name. Yanamami, something like that. I can never pronounce that. Yes? Okay, well, I can't speak to research about why some people have near death experiences or not. I can't even necessarily speak to research about why some people can have mediumistic experiences or ADC, after death communication experiences when they lose a loved one or not. There are certain factors that seem to be correlated with that, but I wouldn't even treat that at this point as data. I think that that's one of the great questions that we have to ask. You know, how much of it's trauma, how much of it is, is an open mind, how much of it is, is, is a becoming non-judgmental, how much of it is, is an emotional connection. I mean, there are so many factors here. And I'm sorry, I wish I could give you an answer. But I have to decide I don't know. Yes? Uh, I think what I have a hard time sort of getting my head around is how consciousness can exist independent of an organ of perception. Like vision is the act of seeing with your eye. If there's no eye, if there's no ear, how can there be vision? Or yeah. I, what I didn't do today was to start off with giving you a, two, two things. One, the history of how I got started in this research. And secondly, what, what theoretical framework led me to get my head around that very question. Okay? Because I, too, for example, with near-death out-of-body experience, you've got a person whose, whose eyes are on the table, they're closed. How can a person be seeing without their eyes and hearing without their ears hovering over their body? And the way I get my head around that, the one-minute story, is that what quantum physics tells us is that what matter is is organized energy. As you know, matter is mostly empty space, and it's mostly information. Also, you know when you look at the sky at night, what you're seeing is a history of starlight, of stars that have been traveling for millions of light, millions of billions of you know, years. And that information does not disappear. If it disappeared or it just became mush, we always see as a gray sky. Instead, what happens is what physics tells us is in a vacuum of space, the information is preserved. And this is mostly, matter is mostly empty space. Now, if we accept both of those things as true, and we recognize that everything that's matter has organized energy, and that we are emitting this organized energy just like the light from distant stars, and we can also document that. Then what happens is, when we die, or even when we leave our body, we haven't lost our eyes, or our ears, or our brains. What happens is we have all the electromagnetic orchestration of eyeness, earness, and brainness. It's just that it's now in the info-energy realm as opposed to, quote, in what we call the material. Because remember, what is light? You know what light is? 
You know what a term photon is? Are you ready for this? And I didn't make this up. This is what a physicist explained. Photons are massless particles that are infinitely small. And they travel for millions or billions of years in a vacuum and do not lose their information. What's a massless particle that's infinitely small? Sounds to me like a story. <laughs> but yet, we see light, right? So the way I twist my head around this is to say, organized energy and information, just like the light from distant stars, all of that is in fact exists in the vacuum. Otherwise, we couldn't have astrophysics. And if we can have astrophysics, then we can have the history of, of all of matter. And if matter is organized energy, then all of this becomes possible. That's how I twist my head around it. Most of this work still gives me a head. <laughs> yes. During the course of your research, has the subject of reincarnation ever entered the mix? Oh boy. <laughs> the answer is yes, it enters the mix a lot. I typically ignore it. Um, I don't ignore it in the sense of you know, dismiss it. But we have not done any research directly on it. What I can tell you is how is that the uh, that the idea that reincarnation requires that the original consciousness, quote, disappear, and, be, and so that it's totally back in a single new cell, that idea does not seem to be true. Meaning, you know, if Lori Campbell, for example, gets information from deceased people who didn't leave just 100 years ago, but 500 years ago, 1,000 you know, years ago, you know, multiple thousands of years ago, and you would think, well, either they didn't reincarnate or we don't have the idea of reincarnation right. It may not be, quote, reincarnation versus survival of consciousness after death. It may be reincarnation plus survival of consciousness after death. And what we mean by reincarnation is just like we mean by seeding, that we take a portion of the history of ourself and, and give it a new. So it's not total recycling. It's, if you would, partial recycling of evolution. And what happens with this kind of research is it ends up leading us to ask novel questions about reincarnation, to ask novel questions about your death experiences, to ask novel questions about what does it mean to be in a coma. I mean, it really does lead us to rethink all these things. Yes? Why do some people, when they die, see like a tunnel, and then uh, some people see themselves? Like, I don't know. But you know what would be fun to do? especially for the people who have died, ask them, okay? 